Professor, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you on start then, please. Uh, can I welcome you to the uh, scrutiny for what the city's corporate resources scrutiny committee uh, today, coming from the Rivers of Wales to the Oval. Uh, before we proceed, can I just check that everyone is able to hear us online? If someone could just give me a thumbs up. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you. The agenda pack with papers is available via ModGov uh, or directly available from the council website uh, from the link that was sent out to, uh, to members. Uh, can I just remind people that when I ask them to speak, could you clearly state who you are for the benefit of anyone who is listening and commenting so they can identify who is speaking and also if I can ensure you turn on the microphones so that you can be heard uh, by those who aren't in the room. Uh, can I also welcome uh, members of the public uh, who are joining us uh, today online. Uh, could I ask those who are joining us online if you could make sure that your cameras and uh, microphones are turned off unless you're actually going to uh, address the committee at, uh, at some point and we'll ask you then to turn those on. Uh, and also a reminder for everyone who's joining us that this meeting is being audio recorded by the council. Uh, again, just to remind people that as the meeting agendas are sent out electronically, uh, could I ask that members and officers refer to page numbers from the agenda pack uh, to assist those who are following us uh, online and with those papers. Just also a couple of housekeeping notes before we start. Uh, if anyone in the room requires toilet facilities, they're out through the door you came uh, into the room. Uh, I've not been told there's a planned fire drill today, so if the alarms go off, they are for real. And finally, for those who are in the room, if you've got a mobile phone with you, can you make sure it's turned off or turned to silent, please? Just so it doesn't interrupt the, uh, the, the meeting. So as that takes us on to the agenda items themselves, first item is apologies for absence. Uh, do we have any apologies? We do, Chair, thank you. Um, we have apologies from Councillor Cottle, for whom Councillor Hopkins is substituting, and we have three committee members online, which are Councillors Smedley, Collins, and Rodriguez. Thank you very much. Uh, item two is minutes of the previous meeting. We've got two sets of minutes uh, to look at today. Uh, the first one is for the meeting on the 7th of September. Are there any comments or questions? Yes, Councillor Hopkins, please. Um, I may be wrong. I'm very happy to be corrected. Uh, I understood that the minutes were an accurate record of what occurred uh, at the meeting. Um, from what I can see, these are a summary and a not very in-depth summary. Um, and would like to know what the legal position is for minutes, which are supposed to be, as I understand them, accurate records that can be referred to back if necessary. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Hopkins, could I ask for a bit more detail in what you're meaning in terms of accuracy and detail? I mean, so, so as a rule, um, and as a guideline within our democratic services team, we would not name specific councillors making points or questions at a committee meeting unless it is a full council meeting. It would generally be summarised as in the committee discussed, the committee questioned the officers about this. Um, but that should also encapsulate the accuracy and the detail of the, of the, of the meeting itself. So, so you're implying that that hasn't happened. In particular, the um, discussions over Petter's Way and the library, where it was talked um, about uh, how Petter only had single placing and was completely, um, uh, shouldn't be used to house anybody, let alone officers of the Biff Council, wasn't mentioned anywhere in the minutes. Thank you. I think we can address that issue and we'll get that updated. If, if members are in agreement, I think we'll also just refer maybe back to the Constitution Committee because I think it's important. I'm understanding from some members that there isn't a consistency across committees in terms of the minutes as to what is recorded in terms of names and detail. I think it's something we need to be consistent across the council in terms of what we are doing. So whether we can pass that back through democratic services to, to have that looked at. Uh, absolutely, Chair. And we are aware as a team, obviously, we, we have five democratic services team doing together uh, back in April. And obviously there's still a standardization process happening across the team and we're and that, that is an ongoing piece of work. So apologies if we haven't been encapsulated with these on this occasion, but we do not see where to call. Councillor Sig. Yes, Chairman, I'm just referring to the bottom of page 15 and the top of page 16 where there is a summary which encapsulates
encapsulates the generality of the matters concerned, uh, referring to the lack of comfort, carbon neutrality, poor energy efficiency, ongoing maintenance costs, etc. Thank you. I noticed that the um, Richard Move that was taken on the agenda in September, but it's no longer on the work program. Where is that? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. If yeah. that went to a different committee, but I'll just, just confirm which committee dealt with that as a yeah. cancellation. Um, that paper actually went to executive, yeah. so that has been that has been resolved. Thank you, Casalot. Uh, AJ, yeah. Um, Looking at the work programme, so just the meeting on the 5th of December is 10 o'clock on my calendar, it's afternoon, 2 o'clock. In fact, I have an interest in that because it's a bank for me. Which if it isn't a clash, then I'll be there. But um, I was just wondering if that could be done. Yes, it, it is indeed uh, CPM. We will have that on the work programme. Thank you. You're ready to be done. Thank you very much. Sorry. Catalog. Sorry, I probably don't open the phone. Did you uh, say it's being rearranged at time? It's a two o'clock meeting 
uh, council lot, and that's it. That's in people's diaries. Well, it clashes. Yeah, well, it also clashes with the planning meeting. I believe is that uh, Mark just mentioned an area at East, and that's quite a few people. So I mean, you know, there's something that needs to be done about these clash meetings. Uh, you know, on the set times, you know, you can't chop and change the times all the time. It's uh, not acceptable. Let's have another one, Chair. Thank you. Any other questions on the work program? Okay, thank you very much. In which case, that takes us on to our first bullet agenda item, uh, which is the Council Tax Reduction and Exceptional Hardship Schemes. And cancellation, I think, you want to introduce this. Well, thank you, Chair. It will be a very short introduction. Um, these papers are all very technical. I thank Richard Seeley and all of his colleagues mm -hmm. very much for the work, the very careful, diligent work that they do on these papers. Uh, and I'm very pleased that I'm able to hand over to Richard Seeley at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Seeley, would you like to introduce us then, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Nelson. Uh, any of those that, that don't know me, I'm Richard C. Interim uh, Resident Benefits uh, Manager for the Council. I'm also joined today by uh, a couple of our leads from the Benefits area, Sean, Sean and uh, Simon Doyle. Uh, thanks again, I've been very happy involved in, in actually producing the, the, the detail on the paper. Um, the, the purpose of the, the report today. Uh, is essentially to bring to you uh, members the proposed council tax reduction scheme for the coming financial year 2024-2025. Um, scrutiny being obviously asked to scrutinise the proposed scheme for the next year. It will then, the intention is that it then goes to executive on the 6th of December and then on to full council on the, the 20th of December for the decision. Uh, just to give a bit of general background to cancer tax reduction. Um, as the report says, uh, for a number of years now, since 2013, councils have been allowed you know, the powers to actually set their own local schemes for cancer tax reduction for working age people. Uh, people with pension age, uh, the, the rules there are still prescribed uh, directly by central government, and we just have to move in those rules. Um, the, the law also requires that we do uh, agree a specific scheme for each financial year. Uh, however, there is no actual requirement almost necessarily to change the rules uh, between uh, one year and the next. Uh, obviously, as members may well recall, last year in the lead up to the creation of the new council, uh, a, a very extensive project was undertaken to actually align what were then four different legacy district schemes into a, a single new scheme, the Sunset Council, um, which would come into operation then from 1st of April. So that exercise last year um, actually um, requires to undertake very detailed financial modelling. Um, we had to undertake a full public consultation exercise, uh, which was actually undertaken over the summer and early autumn last year. Uh, the scheme that we actually implemented uh, is what's known as, a, as an income bandage uh, scheme. And one of the key components of the scheme uh, implemented last year is that we increased uh, for most of the county, um, the, the, the maximum award uh, that we would pay out to those in the most incomes to 100%. Um, one of the previous districts had presumably awarded 100%, but three weren't. So that was quite a major change. Um, and in addition to that, we also developed um, an exceptional and discretionary uh, exceptional hardship scheme to run alongside the main scheme. And that recognised, obviously, that there would be a number of, and, and a minority of people would lose out of the rules. So that's, this gave us a bit of extra discretion to have that going to. Um, that new scheme was then implemented from the 1st of April 2023. Um, and actually, all of that was done without increasing the overall cost of the scheme. Um, so moving on sort of quickly in terms of the, the, the proposed scheme for next year. Um, uh, essentially, we're not proposing any major 
changes in the skin. Um, and as a consequence of that, I've not undertaken the public consultation exercise. Um, the report in front of you um, recommends that we do increase the income band thresholds within the skin uh, in line with the same rate of inflation that the DWP will provide to state benefits. Uh, but that's proposed essentially because um, if, if we uplift uh, by the same proportion that DWP uplifts state benefits by, which most of our clients are in receipt of, that essentially has the effect of actually protecting the amount of uh, reduction in the proportion of reduction that they receive. Um, we don't actually know yet what rate of inflation the DWP will use. That is normally announced in November. So obviously we would feed those figures in um, for the executive and for the council. Um, now doing that actually, uh, because we're uplifting in, in line with proportion from the model we have done, actually again it doesn't increase the, the cost of the, the scheme to us. Um, and what we've shown, and they're indicative figures at this stage because we don't know the actual rate of inflation, but appendix two of the report does show what the indicative uplift would look like. Um, and just to confirm that the existing scheme rules allow us to make that change or propose that change without consultation. Um, unfortunately, there is a but to this. And obviously, uh, given the council's current financial position and the significant budget gap, uh, one of the things I think that you as members are going to need to consider uh, is in fact whether bluntly we can actually afford to uplift those income bound thresholds. Um, and I say that because obviously, if we choose to leave the income bound thresholds, as they currently are, and on the, and if the DWP increase state um, benefits, then actually that would have the net effect of uh, affecting the scheme costing us less money to run. I don't actually have numbers for that at the moment, but we're busy working on those to actually understand what that impact would be. Um, obviously, you know, I'm conscious, what's that say to money? It obviously also impacts on people, and quite clearly, recipients of cancer tax reduction are, are generally speaking what they are by definition people on low end of this. So, obviously, that needs to be in mind. And I hear yeah, logically as well, um, that may also impact in terms of if we do reduce the amount of reduction we pay under the scheme, um, potentially, fewer people pay us. Potentially, we see increased claims for the hardship, but it is a mechanism by which the council will potentially save money, and this could be done without public consultation. Any wider changes to the scheme would require full public consultation. Realistically, I don't think the time um, practically is going to get that done and implemented in time for next year. I'll just say a little bit so about what we did. In terms of developing proposals for next year, and how we essentially reach the conclusion, not that we don't really want to be we shouldn't change the scheme. Yeah, obviously, we're conscious that this year, first of all, we implemented a new scheme across the county. Um, whilst we undertook extensive work last year to model that to try and get it right, obviously, you don't actually know whether you have got it right or not, so you actually. Uh, but it had to really actually switch it on and get right in there. So, consequently, uh, earlier this year, we actually undertook uh, a review of how that scheme was actually working. Um, given that actually at the point that we did this, obviously the scheme had only been in operation for a few months, we quite consciously kept that review quite, quite much. In the longer term, we need a whole year's worth of data, so I think, to be able to properly understand the impact of it. But we can see, we can see enough to actually undertake a light touch with it at this stage. Um, the sorts of things that we looked at, uh, we obviously considered any feedback that we had from customers, from claimants. Um, we looked at the impact of the, the maximum award of 100%. We also looked at the impact on claimants who were, were worse off. Um, we took inflation into consideration, 
nationally across all sectors that's a major it is a major issue um, at, at present time um, we look at the overall cost of the scheme we also looked at national trends and uh, what other trends were doing we also received considered and fed back on the detailed feedback from citizens advice we were suggesting a number of changes to the scheme um, we've considered those um, uh, and responded to them. One of the key changes they requested actually having reviewed it and included an expert, uh, external advice, which we included the board to implement that change and explain to them why. Um, but in general terms, the conclusions of that review are that actually the, the scheme appears to be working well and appears to be introduced without causing major problems. Um, the, the majority of the payments, pre existing payments, are either receiving the same amount of the same proportion of CTR that they previously were, or are in fact receiving more. Um, we're not receiving significant numbers of appeals. Um, all of this, I think, is indicative actually of it actually appears to be, as I say, more than one, two, and quite one. Um, we also look quite carefully as well at how what we're actually spending on exceptional hardship. We anticipated um, a potentially significant increase in claims this year. Um, and uh, we made provision, we recommended provision last year of half a million pounds for exceptional hardship. Um, so we have seen an increase in claims this year, but actually our predictions are that actually the overall on the claims by the end of the year will come in under that 500,000 mark. And in fact, my recommendation for next year, except based on still operating the income base, is that we make provision of someone in reach of 370,000 session on share. Um, and actually, we, we had an unexpected bonus this year in relation to that because early in the financial year, government announced that one off. <laughs> council tax support funding for all councils to assist parents of um, CCR. Um, so we received a reasonable back 800,000. Actually, mm -hmm. the government requirement is that we use that to make um, minimum payments of at least £35 to all existing claims, which we did. Um, we then essentially used the balance of that funding to actually um, fund an exceptional hardship claims that we had. And actually, you know, it doesn't look like we're going to spend that funding. So actually, we're not spending any additional money on exceptional hardship this year. We should be in fact fit to pass the election funding. Um, so, as a consequence of all this, actually, the conclusion we've reached um, is actually that the new scheme is working well. And that actually, because we, we can't see any areas where we need to actually significantly change the, the rules. The only area that, that I think proposes in the report is that we look at increasing possession of the income tax. Um, however, you know, I'll really be interested in point, given the size of the budget gap, that is probably an area that you as members want to see and consider. Realistically, I think you've, you've got two alternative options there. Um, one is to simply leave the income loans as they are. And as I say, if state benefits increase, that will preserve the saving. The alternative would be to increase our income loans by a lower rate than inflation than is used um, by DWP. Um, again, that would deliver the same, but obviously it won't be as much of a saving. And as I say, unfortunately, we have no direct impact on that. So that's the background, and obviously, I'm going to take any questions. Thank you very much. Councillor Hogarth. This yeah. may be the wrong place to talk about this. Is, um, uh, my division got seriously flooded. Um, somehow, you gave council packs to pay back to the people who were flooded. I don't know under which set of of what we're talking about here today. Um, I'd like to thank, on behalf of my 150 people who flooded, because some of them are still out of their houses now. Uh, is that going to be available as climate change gets warmer 
and plugging that small fruit on it. Yeah. You, Correct, yes, uh, that, that isn't directly related to the Council Tax Reduction Scheme. It's okay. very close in legislation, but it's, it's a slightly different area. Um, I mean, ultimately, actually, the, the, it's going to be a decision for your members if you want to um, make relief standard relief available to people that are, are, being, are being flooded. Um, yes, you have powers in Council Tax regulations under section 13A on steam, which I can to make uh, discounts for exemptions for anything we want to. So that actually is, is within the limited members. Obviously what you have to bear in mind is that Somerset Council then as the billing authority bears the entire cost of doing that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of it. Um, you spread up uh, an £800,000 um, government um, input. Um, is that going to be an ongoing um, thing? Was it being described as a as a one off? Will it will it be will it come in next year or the year after? And also, um, what what was the actual balance the eight hundred that you that you spoke of figures? It's, so the, the 800,000 is was a one-off sum of money that they've announced for this year. So it's, we're not aware of any intention to provide um, further funding next year. Um, however, I have to say in, in terms of this, since COVID, you know, we've got very used to the revenues and benefits and <laughs> announcing a very short notice schemes for various things for people to, to, to assist with council tracks or for businesses. So I wouldn't rule that out from doing something next year. But we 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 help factor that into the budget at this point because we're not aware of it. In terms of the balance that was due, the I believe the the initial awards of twenty five pounds uh cost us uh, somewhere in the region of things like three hundred and thirty or three hundred three hundred and fifty thousand pounds. So it left us um, with all um, Five hundred thousand pounds. Um, so actually, we we are um, officers on the ground are actively now out trying to identify cases of potential hardship and encouraging those people to actually claim hardship. Um, one of the ways in which we do that is obviously each time we issue reminders, summonses for case or case of risk, when people contact us. If it's apparent they're experiencing hardship, then we will follow them in the direction of that scheme. Because obviously, that's you know, unconsciously government funding. We don't spend it, they're like, you know, you, you, you may just have addressed my question, but I was going to ask you, and effect, if there is a balance left, do we have to return that, or can we roll that forward to you now in next year? Well, I understand that we have to spend it this year. Thank you. That's the scene. Just on that last point, I am a little appalled that um, given that they're not putting money in through the front door to local government to allow local government to do its basic job, that they're um, backing the horse, over backing uh, their pet project horses um, when actually you know you should be getting it in through the front door. Um, yes, it'd be very nice to have that set of government money, but having it put around the rate based spend is just in another way things go wrong. Uh, it's a ambivalent system that we that whether we should hand that money back. <laughs> um, I think it's uh, adding to a sense. Um, the equality impact assessment, I'm really pleased to see that the, um, the principal proposal that we're going to be putting forward um, uh, uh, scores neutrally or well across all of the um, uh, uh, across all of the uh, uh, characteristics considered. Um, but there isn't a, a, an equalities impact assessment in front of us for the um, uh, for the alternative you know, uplifting in line with inflation or for uplifting below um, people with um, benefit rates. Um, would it be reasonable to presume that there would be an across the board disbenefit for the BBP, um, uh, below the BBP uh, uplift uh, option? Basis that it's effectively passing on partnership deliberately 
um, to, to the recipients. Would it be reasonable to assume that the public um, by inflation would score better with the global performance? We come back to the relation I just wanted to make a point as well as the 800,000 there is of course the household support fund and, and so I, I don't know whether those two are joining up anywhere because we will have through other parts of the council we will have all those records of who's been applying and household support fund and some of that the portion of it that is applied for online has been under great demand. Um, and there are a number of threads ahead. And that, uh, again, is government money coming straight in to Somerset. And um, it doesn't come through, it comes through the local authority, but in a pass through way. So it's a lot more than just the 800 cents. Yes. Thing if we uh, want to come back on the, the, the impact assessment and, and how that will be assessed on, on the, if we were not operating. Uh, the, I think the short answer is we need to undertake an accordance with impact assessment and actually not increasing the income tax thresholds, um, which is something I will make sure we do before it goes to, to executive. I think also it would be useful, we, as I said, we don't yet know. Government's intentions in terms of raising state benefits. Um, and we don't know whether it's going to be a blanket approach to increase them across the board, whether they will make different provision in different areas. I think it's coming back just the clarity you just introduced the fourth option, which is in the paper, which is not operating the uh, threshold at all. Um, I thought the three options which were being considered were doing it at a level which was below. The um, uh, the GWP benefits uh, rate, but not more, but not zero. Um, and you introduce one now which is zero, and then there's uh, the other one which is in the paper, which is to actually match inflation, um, thereby guaranteeing that recipients get um, as much benefits as uh, as the loss of cost, uh, loss of it. Um, uh, value in their income uh, uh, requires, irrespective of what the government does with benefits. Um, and uh, it was only the two that were in the paper that was asking about, but I said that he effectively said in the principal decision we need the fourth one, which is to do nothing. I think to be clear, if you know, to the option that's actually expressed in the paper that we originally developed earlier in the year was to increase in line with the rate of inflation we by GWP, which I think correctly say will protect the proportion of CTR that their claims receive. If you if you want to save money, then which are you know given the budget gap, I think obviously the council is seriously going to need to consider to me that, that there are two options here, which is you either leave those income first thresholds as they are, and apply no reduction to them, sorry, no increase to them, or you increase them but by a lower, lesser rate of inflation than that which DWP will apply to state benefits. Both of those options would save money, um, and just save more or less money. So I think obviously, yeah, going forward to executive. Those options need to accept and to be expressed more clearly in the paper. And um, we are going to need to revisit the, the equalities impact assessment to actually make sure we've brought them back across all the categories, the, the potential impacts of not, in, not increasing those income tax thresholds in line with in that inflation we by keeping the payment. I'm still seeing a gap between what we're saying was expressed in the paper. Oh, yeah. my phone. Sorry. I'm still seeing a gap between what we're telling you verbally what's actually on the piece of paper and the piece of paper needs to be clear. So on the bottom of page 27, we summarise the other options. So I'm not operating. Operating in line with CPI or another index of inflation, irrespective of what the DWP does, or operating in line with the DWB state benefits increase, which need not necessarily be in line with any index, but it's usually CPI. And the 
point to make is one is deliberately part of writing and deliberately part of how she wants to recipients to benefit, which is something I could not have yours. One is basically ensuring them against whatever the government does by increasing the benefits we pass in, which is an additional um, undertaken by ourselves um, uh, at extra cost over and above the uh, that the government does, or letting it lie with the government uh, and get pulled with the duty of being off. And to me, that seems reasonable because it's cost neutral and is essentially, um, you know, making quite clear where the decision is being made. It's been made by several governments in the duty of European. Um, knowing that we have a mechanism to cover extreme hardship as well, should there be um, a consequence of the government's action. Um, and I, I think moral, that's, that, that is totally defensible. But if those three things don't act exactly along with what I thought you said to me just now, the verbal explanations. I think if I, to my, uh, my understanding is that since the report was, was written, in effect, more information has come forward in terms of where we'll be in the report coming a little later, the, the financial position of, of the council. So that extra option will be produced as part of the paperwork, which will go to the executive and then to a sense. And I think your point about making sure that, that is very clear in terms of the, the impact that has on, on recipients is something that is going to have to be explicit within the proceeding to executive. And I think that's a range of the, the sort of decisions that we'll see in the next two reports we're going to be looking at in due course cancellation. Thank you, Chair. I think you're absolutely right that there is something else that hadn't occurred to me until today, which is the possibility of putting as an option not upgrading the income thresholds, but extending the exceptional hardship scheme. I think that is another option that we probably want in the list of options. Um, that then gives us a bit more wiggle room if there's government money comes in late, because that can help the exceptional hardship scheme more easily than something you set the previous December. So I think I think your point is a really good chair that things have changed since this paper was first written. And um, that is the value of scrutiny coming in before executive and full council. You made my next question, which was going to ask about the effect of policy as well. It would be uh, within the, the right of the report that I'm looking at whether that exceptional policy allowance needs to build in the impact that potentially might come through with extra hardship. Councillor Trimble. Um, thank you. It's only a quick question, but I wonder how easy is it for people to apply for exceptional hardship? How, how, how are they made aware? That this is something they can do because obviously, if we're upgrading, that just happens to them and they don't need to think about it. But how do people, you know, know that there is an option if they're really struggling? Because I think that's quite significant in our thinking. Yeah. Uh, will, will we include that on the literature on the CWR solution to customers? And um, said it's also something that can help. So when we start our recovery process, if it's well, at that point, it's going to be all that this is available. And the staff that are dealing with customers that is where they are contacting us because they're having a pain, you know, I'm well aware of the fact that we have this scheme available and how they need to be signed by host. Um, you know, quite obviously, yeah, you know, as just to, to back up the chair's comments. One of the things we're going to look at is if we're framing a potential option here, which is around not increasing those income thresholds, then actually we need to have a look at that and ask the question that okay, we have to reassess, really assess, I think, that provision for hardship, because realistically, you know, take money away from people, some of those people are going to come back and say, well, we still can't afford it today. Um, so, you know, that is something we're going to get as well for you. That's only quickly, but uh, a quick comment, but obviously we would need to make sure that we were looking out for people who might fall between the cracks because not everybody reaches out, and I think that's probably the issue. Not everybody has access to the internet where we might have a chance such things. So we need to be really aware, and maybe even speak to people like our medical services, um, you know, so that they can have people who turn to them um, 
you know, and actually it's because of an underpinning financial need. I think so. That's something that the council would do have to look at, make sure the information is out there. We, we, we just like the village agents who again would be a point of contact with you rather than being in touch with local councillors. The then have the latest on the criminal lines to be indicated. Yes, Jim, but I just think um, in principle, um, well, first, we've got a scheme that was really carefully crafted over a long period of time and is currently assessed as working well. Um, my uh, difficulty with filling with um, uh, thresholds is a way of achieving relying on the uh, fallback of the Ascension Partnership Scheme. Uh, my difficulty with that is effectively what we're doing is we're taking a, a, a design scheme where the equality between people has already been uh, considered as obsessed into spot judgments by officers because the exception of hardship scheme is just that it's uh, it's fairly exception it's intended for the stuff that the scheme can't cope with not um uh, threshold resistances uh and where it would be basically putting it into threshold resistances i would be much happier to have well designed scheme and only be dealing with the exceptional hardship for exceptional hardship um, and uh, so uh, I'm a little bit worried about filling the thresholds way of dealing with it. it. I think it's reasonable to say um, uh, looking for a, a cost neutral scheme uh, as a way of doing it, but just totally not upgrading thresholds. I'm concerned that, that that's basically pushing a lot of people over into the exception of partnership scheme, creating different responses from the council for different circumstances. Spot by spot by spot, uh, rather than unknown uh, basket of risk. Thank you. And um, if it's worth pointing out that we didn't know exactly how this scheme would play out in its first year, and that's why we were so keen to have that exceptional hardship scheme, because we didn't know. We knew that some people would be better off, some people would be the same, and some people would be worse off because the districts had all run different schemes. So I think we have already had that kind of... Um, I think the thing that really matters most to me, and I'm sure to you and everyone else in the room, is the kind of modelling on what I call pain versus gain. Because if we can't model what financial gain there would be by keeping the income threshold the same, then it's pointless exercise, it just upsets people, causes them greater concern. But the other point I wanted to make, Chair, uh, was at the executive yesterday, and I realise this is the wrong way round. Um, we did agree the three year funding for citizens' advice, and that's non statutory citizens' advice funding. But we have put in place funding for three years for citizens' advice, five years for SPA, in the hope that we, that whatever the future holds that we're doing our very best for getting the right advice for people at every stage. And, and I think the cons people in this catch done a really good job over last winter um, with the House of Support Fund, and I'm sure whatever comes forward in the same way from the government, they'll do the same again. That's a lot. Yeah, thank you. I've listened to what everyone said, and I mean, yeah, we want to help everyone that we can help but we have to you touched on it yourself earlier chairman when you said circumstances have changed circumstances has changed and we are going to have to make some hard decisions and it's not going to be whether it's a it, it would be nice to help everyone that we want to help but we are not going to be able to help everyone we have to face that and we have to start facing up to the fact that we you know, can help some, and uh, we have to evaluate how we get to uh, who we are going to help. And I mean, we've heard the officers report. There's further information to come back through where the where the level of pensions is going to affect this. And until we get all the information, it's very very difficult. Yes, we would like to help everyone, but we have to also accept we're going to have to make some hard decisions. None of us have been in this position before, and uh, like it or not. We've got to face up to it that we will have to make these uh, considered decisions and they're not going to be palatable for some and uh, as what they are for others. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think members have not got anyone indicating on online. So if, if I could draw that nice to a close, what I would say is I think 
it is worth noting that this was a new scheme that was introduced for the bringing together of all the councils, and it's notable how successful it appears to have been in the way that it's been received by people and the way that it's operated. Uh, and so, part of our thanks, obviously, to the team for all the work they did to put it together uh, and also operated as, as well as they have. Um, we've, we've heard, obviously, there are there are issues going forward in terms of funding and the, the documentation will need to come forward with a, a detailed impact assessment of any other potential changes that might impact on, on residents. And to bear in mind the, the hardship fund and how that might play into to any changes that may come forward. Um, and also the, the issue with rate about making sure there's advice and, and information out there as widely as possible so that people who need to benefit from the scheme can make sure they do so. I will get come to you one more time, cast the seat, but so um, Yes, Jim, I just wanted to um, expand a little on your point. It, it was a new scheme for this camp for people. It was a brand new camp. So this scheme is substantially a modification of the uh, previous South Sunset scheme, which itself had been some four or five years in the development and had been operating very successfully and had been itself settled. And then further learning was brought in when the proposal were put together through all four councils together. So it is actually a more mature scheme than is given uh, than the impression we gave. Um, it has, if you like, been carefully piloted and settled, um, and um, uh, if they were involved in that exercise. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, so we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Thanks to the team for the presentation today as well. Um, item seven is the budget monitoring report. There's, there's a cancellation on touched on earlier, and obviously this was discussed yesterday at uh, Executive. This is, my understanding is this is the last time that we are around this way, as we have now made sure that the, the, the scrutiny meeting will be taking place in advance of the Executive, so we can actually feed into to the, the rules of discussion. Uh, but cancellation, if you'd like to introduce this, please. Thank you, Chair, and uh, I'll apologise to anyone who had to listen to this yesterday. I will try to keep it a little bit briefer than yesterday. So, first of all, I acknowledge that this report is now out of date. I apologise for that. Uh, and as we've already mentioned, the month six report will look different. Um, this projected outturn figure in this report is actually slightly reduced from the previous version that have reached 30 million. Um, but even that it's reduced figure is much, much too high. Um, so we know now that we're in the uncomfortable company, many councils. So even amongst the county councils, which have generally been the most resilient in terms of reserves, and they're one in ten now at risk of a sexual one on four notice. And that across county council network across includes plenty of unitary councils too. Uh, so our position is moving fast um, and the appropriate consideration is being given at the right committee, so including this committee and the audit committee, and there is a huge amount of work going on in the back office, as we would expect. Rather than keep that concern to the back office, um, taking the approach of addressing in public my huge concern about Sunset Council's viability, I'm sure that's shared with all staff, all members, uh, and all of my colleagues particularly who have heard me talking about this for many, many months now. Um, and we've also returned back to the Panorama programme, for instance, in 2019, um, where social care for COVID and everything else was referred to as a ticking time bomb. So I won't draw the obvious comparison with what's happened to the bomb more recently. But I do realise that local government reorganisation is still ongoing. People are still putting schemes of officers together and this need to be more transparent and open at this time is not taken lightly. So the words that I had to use yesterday, which uh, I would use later about declaring a financial emergency, means that work then has to happen much more rapidly um, in order to keep us on that budget setting timescale. So that's our reality. We also have to acknowledge that the business case for the sunset 
which we've inherited as an administration and which is still the focus for our endeavours, was written in a different time. So 2019, early 2020 does feel like a completely different time now. Uh, it's still a focus for LGR, of course, but we have these following impacts on local government. Since then, COVID, obviously, also the vaccination programme, which affected social care more than it affected NHS because of the need to be vaccinated to work in a social care setting, but not the NHS. The end of the government, fairly enormous COVID grants, where those grants actually did mask some issues with providers' costs and also mask our fee structure for adult social care where we were. We were and actually still are lower than neighbouring councils. We've had Brexit with its impact on European workers in Somerset, many of them in the care sector. We've had the commencement by Boris Johnson at the beginning of his prime ministership, and then the postponement of the fair cost of care exercise that opened the book on the fees paid right across the country, across county boundaries, across different providers, and that has in itself exposed the low fee structure for Somerset, which we are addressing, but it has not brought forward the government monies that would have been part of the fair cost of care. We've also had, of course, the invasion of Ukraine, causing so many people to lose their homes for other countries, and the huge impact that's had on energy costs. We've had inflation moving up to double figures, which has also affected food prices. We've had a short and disastrous period following the mini budget of this trust, which had a maxi impact, leading to increases in interest rates after historic low rates from 2010 to 22. That's led to increases in homelessness caused by increasing rents and mortgages. We've had reductions in the value of commercial properties at the same time as government is telling councils that they need to dispose of commercial investments if they wish to take on additional borrowing or capitalisation directions. And we've had the government taking the view that local authority reserves should be used, not kept in reserve. At the same time, we're seeing the absolutely essential need to have reserves in the local government. So they have all changed our financial landscape of the whole country and therefore of some extent. And it means that we could not have embarked on local government reorganisation at a more challenging time. We could not be looking for a viable future for this new council at a more difficult time. But it is our task and it is our responsibility to do that without the need of government commissioners coming from outside the county and take decisions for the people of Somerset that do not have local knowledge, that do not have the commitment that we have to the people of this county. So I'd acknowledge as well, Chair, that there are concerns from members about the income from the amalgamated portfolio of commercial investments, which are a line in the budget, sitting present just under 20 million per annum. And I do know uh, that monthly monitoring of every budget line is hugely important, and I realise that also affects the maintained schools as well. So I'm going to hand over, I'm not sure if I'm handing over to Jason or to Christian, but I'll hand over for um, the more technical detail. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Ms. Um, so Jason Ball, Executive Director of Services, um, and the Council Section 151. Um, members will recall the decision taken to introduced the new finance system like to solve the dynamics in the new council. This was based upon delivering a minimum viable product for the new council in April 24. For month six, we have taken a step forward on logic monitoring with the introduction of the Solver reporting tool. This provides us with more accurate financial information going forward. The experience of every other new unitary has been when you bring all of the council's budgets together 
it is difficult. Councils account for things in slightly different ways. When you discover a number of errors, judgments, and assumptions made, they will show through the budget monitoring report for you. We are no different. We have experienced all of those. Budgets are being done to the correct place for any council. And as I said previously, this takes time and resources. It will actually take us the whole year to fully complete. A particular problem for us has been around the staffing establishment with the HM records and SAC not aligning to the approved staffing budget held on finance. Considerable work has been ongoing to correct this, and the work is now nearing completion. The staffing establishment is quite complex as it brings the five former council staffing structures together into one new staffing structure for the new council. For some services, this is fairly straightforward. But for others, it's more difficult and complex to start to potentially sit in a number of different services. Whilst on staffing, I can report that the National Pay Award increase for staff has now been agreed at £1,925. This will be paid to staff at the end of the month and backdated to the 1st of April. When the 23 24 budget was agreed by Council in February, we estimated the national pay award for the year to be 5%. Our estimates of the agreed pay award is that it is equivalent to 6.1% increase in the pay This extra cost is approximately £2 million when taking into account our employer on costs. We'll have more accurate figures over the next couple of months. This additional cost has been forecast within the budget monitoring, the budget monitoring report before you today and allowed for the contingency. The executive has previously agreed that due to the financial challenges we face, there will be a monthly reporting of both scrutiny and an executive. And I'm pleased that it will be able to executive. It's coming to scrutiny before executive in the future because their new comments can be fed through. As the Section 151 officer, I'm obviously very concerned about the forecast level of overspend for the year. In September, I put in place spend controls at departmental level, which were set out in the month three budget monitoring, which were approved by the executive. The details were on paragraph seven of the report the budget today on page 140. However, I didn't feel that these were having the desired impact on the overspend. I have now strengthened these by putting in full controls across the entire council. Duncan Sharkey, as the Chief Executive of Police Health, announced these to start last week's leadership briefing, and the Chief Executive has emailed all staff informing them of the new arrangements. And we also covered them with the staff briefing yesterday. There's an overall board chaired by Mel Rock focused on reducing down the in year overspend. Sitting underneath that are a number of different boards a recruitment control board, virtual procurement control board, spend control board, and there are also placement panels for both adults and children. Moving on to the report itself, the key variances are summarised in Table 1 showing the adverse variance of £27 million pounds for the year, with the details of each service set out in pages 146 to 183. The month six report will change in format, with a summary table showing more detail down to the service level. We will continue to focus on the key variances and highlights areas of concern, set out what actions are being taken to address them. The areas that are causing us concern, the most significant variances, not only impact upon the current year, but they flow through to next year, as you'll see in the financial strategy update report with the next item on the agenda. Any overspend in this financial year will have to be funded from reserves, and we currently have £49.8 million in general reserves to cover this. However, our overall level of reserves is less than I would like them to be, given the financial challenges we face. Any use of reserves to fund this year's budget overspend is not available to support next year's budget. And given the next report on the agenda, that is extremely concerning. 
I'm confident by taking the measures that I've outlined that we will see reduction in spend. What I am not confident about, given the key drivers of the end spend, is that we can bring it down to zero by year end. I have to say, any questions or clarify? Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Yes, I see. There are um, two things happening outside of uh, the council in terms of perception. Um, one is that we haven't delivered the savings in the uh, in the Help Your Business case. When it appears to be we delivered some of them, but we are and we are behind, so that's fair. But the magnitude involved, the monies involved in that, are not what's actually driving the situation we are seeing here. The other thing is, I, 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 I'm wondering if we have clarity, because I, I suspect what we've got here is some of the levers that are um, messing this up are extremely long, like the increase in the costs of placement in adult social care due to the repricing in the market, due to the disruption in the market, due to the way that the government handled uh, the, re uh, the revelation of previously um, private data between suppliers, which revealed that in Somerset, where wages are, uh, wages are historically low, and also with billing of historical low, the charges were historically low, and we now have companies making very large margins, uh, while still, you know, basically, and carers at a very low rate, but they're making much larger margins because they know that other areas charge much more. And it's my, my perception at the moment from the figures I've seen that the magnitude of that difference alone explains, again, just wipes out all the benefits of the LGR savings by several factors. And if that's the case, I think, you know, we're losing the communications on because people shouldn't really be um, uh, blaming this on the council uh, at all. It can't be the council if it's, if it's central government action. Um, and it also fits with the picture I'm picking up nationally. There's one in ten councils in the same situation of waiting for a, a for one on call. And there are several councils who've already passed that threshold. And it also explains some of the things we've seen commissioners doing, like 10% and 15% council tax rises. Um, and I just wondered if you could, could uh, you know, if you could, could get some, uh, uh, some, some feel. Of, uh, is that an accurate perception? This is principally being driven by one or two massive things, which have just completely swapped the boat. More cancellations there. Um, I'll start on that because I, I think, I think your point was a really good one. Um, the savings from LGR. Um, both of them are well on track, some of them are behind, I agree with that. Some of them, I don't believe, were ever achievable. That's my personal view, particularly on leisure, where, where um, those of us who are district councillors know the detail of the contracts, PFI and leases that make those savings in the short term pretty much impossible. But that's only one bit of it. There's another part that we've not really touched on yet, which is historically low council tax in Somerset. So yesterday, the executive meeting, we were having a look at what comparator councils, because we're now comparing with other unitaries, so Cornwall, Dorset, Wiltshire particularly, what their council tax brings as a yield. So we have to look at, we look at the base and the yield, well, that's what I call them, that might not be accurate, but the council tax base is about how many houses in each of the bands. And if we go back to 1974, a lot of the higher banded houses in the old historic Somerset went to what is now Baines and North Somerset. Uh, so our average is not a band D at all in Somerset, it's actually a band C. Some of the northern councils have an average that is a band B, so you can see why they struggle. My personal view, and the more I think about it, the more I'm sure that council tax is not the right mechanism for adult social care. I think it needs to be nationally funded, locally delivered. 
that then, then puts council tax in that that too difficult basket where many many governments have just said since whenever it was 93 put this in don't look at it again we can't cope with it because house prices have increased so much in the south and not in the north so we've got, and then we had, we had six years of council tax freeze in the county council and in some of the districts. So you can never make that up unless you're a government commissioner. So we need to look at how what the government comes up with for every council that is putting out distress signals because it's across even across the metropolitan councils now. Uh, the London boroughs, the county councils, the unitaries, the districts, particularly the smaller unitaries. This is not something that's politics specific. It's not something that's geography specific. It's right across the country and it's right across the political spectrum. And actually how it's presented is really interesting because it would appear today in the mainstream press we're being compared with Birmingham. Now, Birmingham has a very specific situation that is not the same as ours. We are income versus expenditure. We have an aging population to add to that low council tax base and to yield. And we have all of those factors that I won't read out again, but they're still there that have affected the situation for local authorities. It is not a simple thing that you can put into one line and put on some piece of social media is much more complex. Next year. Thank you, Cassie. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, you've confirmed my perception, which I, I note is actually um, item 16 and we've table on page 221 of our agenda on the transformation programme that you know there were 18 and a half million pounds worth of savings in the LGR business case. We can only find 17.38 million of those at all. Um, so something we're achieved on. And the progress to date, um, we've achieved 3.8 million uh, out of five and a half that we should have had uh, under our belts by the back end of this year. So I think that is confirming my perception. Uh, and thank you for that. Um, I totally agree that the point of the distribution of the tax base is, is a very, very good reason why central government should be giving um, uh, uh, funding to local government to balance the, inequal uh, the inequalities that happen due to just ancient history. You know, the distribution of types of houses, for example, I, I might even call that a levelling up agenda, you know. Um, so uh, I agree there. And, um, but the point which I was really driving at my question was, I have the perception that the effect on Somerset Council of what the government did with adult social care and the way it handled the cessation of funding and the way it exposed data which had previously been private has hit us right between the eyes and that the length of that lever is at least four, maybe five times the length the LGR savings. And if that, can we confirm that my perception is, uh, is is correct there. And can do you actually have a number for it? Do you have an estimate? I think you're right in that the scale of the situation with the cost of social care in Somerset is in a different league than the savings for or move to one Somerset. I'm not I'm not sure what you're exactly what you're asking me to respond to. Sorry. Assume. I've seen other people making estimates and asking people, um, you know, who are, who are inside the tent to give me um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, some clarity. Um, you know, I've seen estimates that, you know, this is of the order of four or five times the LGR saving. Uh, and just, that's just the effects of the way it was handled. And if that is, if that is reasonable, I think it is misperception. Uh, uh, going on that this is, you know, in any way the uh, uh, the council's um, mishandling the situation. I think that, you know, officers are handling this as well as I could reasonably expect given the circumstances. You've explained some of the national stuff which is hitting it, uh, which has it historically like, you know, so on and so forth. 
um, it's trust and inflation, so on and so forth. But this specific element, it's we, we've got an idea of the exact impact on Somerset. And in today's Western Gazette, one of our MPs was having a positive thesis. Now I'm going actually, no, that, that's a misperception. You know, this act the, the blame for this lies elsewhere. Say, I would say the savings from LGR were predicted for 18.4 million. So my understanding on adult social care, so this doesn't include children's services or all the other myriad of services delivered by this one council, that that figure will move 70 million from the figure that we set in the budget in February of this year to the figure that we expect to be a more realistic figure for the year 24-25. That has been modelled on, and I'm sure Councillor Ruddle may wish to come in because he would have seen this more closely than I have. That has been modelled on the deepest of deep dives into adult services, cost per hour for domiciliary care, placement costs on all the different types of placements. Uh, and it has been done literally on a line by line basis in order to try and get us to a position where we set a figure that we can live with. So if we go back over previous years, even with the additional big set for adult social care, as we've got into the year, it's looked undercooked. And so we need to, at this time, train to find a sustainable and realistic future for Sunset Council. We need to work much harder on those predicted spends. You're absolutely right. So the 18.4 billion would not have done it for the County Council on its own, let alone for the services of all five councils put together. Does that help at all? Thank you. Well, I'm pleased to see you. Can I thank you very much for the candidate there? And the reason I was driving that home is because I, I think really we need to have in the public domain some level of understanding of the scale of this. Because ultimately, there will be a long period of churn and a long period during which this is set. But at least it sets out why people will see such a radical change in what the council is able to do. And why should we end up in a situation where we end up with commissioners rather than being masters of our own destiny? Why they do what they do? Because it's fairly clear what they do from what they've done to other councils. I'm just going to be honest, what's simplistic and probably naive question. But looking at page 142, uh, where we've got a budgetary monitoring report and showing where the services are in terms of, of addressing um, overspends. Looking down the list, basically, all services are in the last month standing still or improving in terms of trying to address that, with the exceptions of, of adult services and children um, who are still with increasing deficits. So bearing in mind where we are in terms of having to avoid a long fall, what are we doing in terms of those two services? And are we looking at what is stacked regime? Because obviously if the one on four happens, we're back to whatever is statutory. So are we are we looking into the de detail of that so that we can make those decisions rather than somebody else coming in and doing it to us? Because it looks to me as things stand at the moment. Unless we sort out whatever is happening in adults and children's, whatever else is happening in the rest of the council doesn't go anywhere near meeting what we need to address. Yeah, it's, in terms of the scale of the adults and children's budget, it's compared to the rest, they are you know, the, the, the most significant part of our spend. So those controls that I mentioned earlier, they will have effect in adults and children's as well. So they're, they're not exempt. And you know, every service we have. More than just adults and children, so statutory services, planning to the statutory service, revenues and benefits, finance. You know, we have we have a whole load of services that are statutory, actually. The vast majority of our services are statutory. The vast majority of our spend is on statutory services. There's always a question of can you do it to a different level? Um, and that's what we need to sort of answer as part of the module process. In terms of those controls, they do affect adults and children and everything else. So the, the spending controls. 
is in place, the will don't have to be in fact in a moment. The staffing establishing controls that are in place, and we're not just the building of posts, but actually people just buy. That's not to say we're not doing recruitment. It's because actually sometimes that actually costs you even more. Money. There are certain posts that if you don't have them, they bring in income and they deliver things that actually financially wise, that's a really stupid thing to do. So actually those, those boards are actually considering it in the round to making sure it's focused on delivering what we have to do and reducing the costs. The procurement board is stopping all future procurements and challenging do they need to go ahead? Do any uplifting contracts need to happen? Is there a different way of doing it? Can we drive down some of those contract costs? I think that will have a particular impact across adults and children with some of the things. And the final element is around those uh, placement panels. That is where most of our spend is coming from. So if you look at the adults budget, although it clearly is a large budget, 186 million pounds in the regional budget, 93% of that is spent on placements. Put it in perspective. So actually, if I'm putting in tight controls around the expenditure, I'm missing the big piece, which is the placement spend. So those placements absolutely are the key in my job, challenging the placements. Can we do them cheaper? Is there a different way of doing it? So we are, we are tackling that. This is hard work. Um, but I'm confident the sort of things we've put in place will start to address those. Whether demand in those areas increases or not is, a, is another issue. I think the general thing around certainly adults is it's not demand per se we're coming through, it's the cost of placements. So it's not like we're seeing lots of extra people come through the front door. It's the cost of the people you've got already. That that is the key point. We've got Councillor Rebel with us, and I think you've got Councillor Munt online. Is there anything you want to, to add, Councillor Rebel, and I'll count Councillor Munt? I think everybody's saying the same. I, I, I get that placements are, are a major issue. Um, the problem is, um, it's set to bed, isn't it? And you know, we, we commission, so we, we can throw no caravan, we can chair no. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, so, so that's right. On. I didn't press it on the stage. It doesn't want to hear what I'm saying. But so basically, it's set to let. So we control no care homes, we control no residential homes. So if you don't control that market, I'm afraid you're into the commercial market. And what's happened is, as Liz said, Jason said, we've been paying very, very low over many, many years. The problem is, is now come back, I'm sorry to say, it's come back to us. And um, we paid, you know, we had a really low rates. We should have addressed it many, many years ago, many, many years ago, probably five years ago. I think we should have been looking at this, to be honest. I've got a very good look at this. I've got all the officers doing what they can to try to. I'm even going around myself with all codes and commissioners to see whether we can talk to, to talk to operators, whether we can, so we can try to keep crazy prices stable. Um, you know, we, we've got a couple of operators, smaller operators that are prepared to talk to us. We're going to meet another operator in about four weeks' time and see whether we, a big operator that, you know, just more complex needs to see whether we can stabilise that price. We are trying to think outside the box. We're really trying to offer the one there. Penny's working flat out. Britain's working flat out. Jason's working flat out. It's trying to resolve the decision. We're not going to bring that gap massively down. I can tell you that now. If we're not going to be able to do that. Um, I'd love to come in this room and say, zero, we're not going to do that. Um, but um, I, and we're also looking at the savings for next year. The problem is, I will warn you all now, we're going through a winter, and that does worry me. Really does worry me. But um, I'm sure you have the committee that we're doing all we can in our house to try to address this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's what I was saying. It's over my shoulder. Would you like to go ahead? Thank you. Are you are you saying I can speak? I'm sorry, I yes. this is cutting out <laughs> dreadfully. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Bob. Um, all I wanted to say was, as you probably know, there are something like 295 statutory responsibilities tied to both my post and to the Director of Children's Services post. Um, and we have to meet our statutory um, responsibilities. That's the first thing I would say. Second thing I would say is that we are making savings, but a lot of those have been hidden. And I've actually asked the team to look at um, bringing those forward so people can see the savings that we're making. 
um, because and the way that they're hidden is because our overspend goes down a bit, up a bit, down a bit, down a bit, down a bit, up a bit, down a bit. Um, so it looks like less of an overspend instead of actually a saving. And I want to give confidence to the council and to and to officers that we recognise the work that they're doing, which is enormous, but also to councillors and to the public that we are actually making those savings where we're able to. Um, and there's a lot going on. The third comment I would make is that you know our overspend is actually or our perceived overspend and the services that we offer are a reflection of the demand the increased demand and the complexity of those children and young people whom we are and families whom we are um we must help and we're the subject again of a broken care market and that's come up through the county council's network and the county treasurer's report from the society of county treasurers um, and they are really clear in that they've you know explored the overspends in children's services generally and it's a national problem again um, but if i think um, an example that i used yesterday was we have a placement that um, came into existence as a result of an emergency where a young person um, needed to come into care urgently we had to go into the unregulated market because there were no regulated places available and that was at a cost of 20, 25,000 pounds a week which now that young person will not stay in those circumstances but if you were to project that forward over a year that one placement is 1,300,000 pounds over a year one child one child and that child needs help needs our help needs our support and so every single placement is we do everything we can and you'll all be familiar with the homes and horizons project which is just amazing and is changing young people's lives but that's required us to invest to be able to save a huge amount of money i think our savings on that particular project at the moment and they will hopefully increase as time goes forward um as something like 2.7 million but you know what we have to do we are continually driving to reduce our overspends um and actually to make positive savings so i i think you know, I, I would offer that. I'm very happy to take any questions, but I can promise you we are doing absolutely everything we can within that statutory framework of 295 responsibilities. Thank you very much. I've got Kathleen Wilkins. Kathleen, yeah, I did have two questions. One for Dean, one for Tessa. I think Dean's actually pretty much answered my question, which was going to be um, about what he is doing over the beyond what Newton is doing, but it's not like you are already working very much on savings and that with that. Um, my second question to Tessa is on the, um, the, the large rise in the cost of sense transport. Um, I, I wondered whether, the, whether this was simply due to <laughs> fuel costs and, and um, and extra costs, um, um, extra other costs, or whether it's due to a lack of competition in, in that area. Um, you were. Yes, I go ahead. Okay, thank you. Sorry, it's terribly unclear. I think I picked up most of Richard's question. Um, so um, I want to reassure councillors. Um, that there is a transport board in place and I'm working with my colleague Mike Rigby and with officers um, to make sure that we look, we drill down into the costs of special education needs and disabilities transport arrangements. Clearly these are incredibly high. There are two reasons for that perhaps. Well, one of them, Richard, you mentioned the cost of fuel, inflation, um, the cost of employing staff, the lack of availability of staff. Um, we all know that the problems we've had with drivers over a period of time, we have some specific sets of circumstances which have 
soaked up the drivers in the Somerset market, but also we've had the additional problem that a lot of those people who were driving for us, who are Europeans, have gone back home after the Brexit arrangements. The um, So the competition is, well, where there is, you know, there's a lot of demand and not a lot of supply, then there's a, it's a very nice place for someone who's driving to be in a position um, to be able to tender for our services. Um, the other thing I would say is you, we need to just remember that in 2019, for example, we had um, 2,100 young people with special educational needs and disabilities who had what we call an EHCP, an education and healthcare plan, and attached to that very often is transport. Now, we are in the current situation where I believe we have 5,300 it is a massive increase, 2,100 to 5,300 education and healthcare plans for young people in Somerset. And each of those has a transport responsibility. Most, most of those have a transport responsibility applied to us. And again, I will, I'll, sorry, um, I could hear somebody else. Um, and what I would say is, again, I, I talked about the fact that it's a supplier's market. Um, as all of you will know, because I have actually said this before, where there was the requirement, one journey that we were quoted, perhaps, I think it was in August, um, a nine minute journey. Somerset Council was quoted by a transport supplier. Um, a nine minute journey there from home to school and then from school to home at the end of the day. And the quote that was given to us was 40,000 pounds, 40,000. So you will understand the difficulties in that kind of a market. It is near on impossible to operate like that. That's just not where we should be. So we're looking at lots of different ways um, through the transport board and by working with our highways, highways colleagues to see what it is that we can do to fix fix this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions in the room? Okay. In which case, thank you very much. I uh, think we're, we're all away from the, the papers and the, the information we've had today. But, uh, We've got uh, a lot of challenges ahead. Um, we'll get further information, obviously, on our, our next meeting in December when the new format will come through and there'll be a bit more information coming through in terms of the work that's going on behind the scenes at the moment, looking as to where we go forward. So, um, can I thank you all for the information that you've done today? Can I thank Councillor Rubble and Munt for, for attending today so that you could uh, could address the questions that Munt had? Uh, and if everyone's happy, we will. Move on to the next item. Thank you. Uh, which is the financial strategy, and we're back to the uh, cancellation. Thank you again, Chair. Um, <clears throat> there, there's something that I've heard Jason Bourne say that I keep repeating now because I think it's a really good summing up of where councils are. So Jason said that all councils are facing in the same direction, we're all moving forward in the same direction. But the starting line is not straight and it's not even. So that's why you're seeing some councils come forward um, with um, concerns about Section 114, others coming forward talking about budget gaps, and others saying we're okay this year, we may be okay next year, after that we can't set a budget. So these things will depend on amount of reserves where they are, what their council tax base and yield is, what their demographic is. You know, there are all of these things that have to be concerned. Um, we are hearing from more. Once we started hearing from the municipal authorities as well, so goodness me, this is kind of, uh, and there have been some really good uh, headlines about it becoming a systemic problem for local authorities, and I think that's exactly where we are. So on this paper that went to the executive yesterday, there are some very, very clear and very challenging recommendations. Um, yesterday, Chair, I actually went through those recommendations and the reason for each one. And if you would indulge me, I'd like to do the same again, if I may. So um, I started off by 
explaining that this is the first time we've used that term financial emergency. I remember referring to it back in 2017-18, where actually the scale of the savings now looks even less than the savings from local government reorganisation, and so this does look in a completely uh, a different place. So we were trying not to cause greater concern for all the staff of this very large and immature council as they were working to put the services and the staffing teams together. But now the situation is too serious. It needs this council to move faster. And so I imagine there was no option but to start using um, financial emergency. That was recommendation A. Recommendation B is about uh, the discussions with DLUC, Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities, following the letter from Jason Bourne to civil servants there concerning the council's financial challenges. So that letter was published for the audit committee at the back end of October. Uh, the audit committee met. I think you may know already that the committee asked for an uh, extraordinary meeting in December to look at in more detail the council's response. There was also a letter published for audit from the external auditor from Thornton, that's Barry Morris, uh, to the chief executive. And both Barry Morris and the chief executive were present at the audit committee meeting, which kind of it's always interesting to see who turns up at meetings because it tells you a great deal. I was quite surprised actually that there was less attention yesterday to the executive meeting. And I think that might be partly that there are so many councils now saying the same thing. So that there is more focus on, for instance, the Manchesters and the Birmingham's and the London councils because they're huge, they've got a higher word that they they have a higher something in the country with higher profile in the country and so there are now so many people in front of me behind me and to the side of me saying the same thing the danger of that is that people become used to it and they don't take proper note of it and they do not realize how serious it is and i have a horrible feeling that MPs, particularly ministers and secretaries of state, I'm not sure that they realise how many services are run by local councils. And I think if this systemic situation continues without government action, they're going to find out, but they will find out when it's too late and those services are reduced or stopped. So we also uh, looked at disposal of commercial investment portfolio. Uh, and that is important at this stage because for Jason as our 151 officer to continue to speak to DLUC about the possibility of a capitalisation direction, which he can explain, not me, it's really important that that first question of do you have commercial assets can be answered by saying yes, and we have taken a public decision to dispose. Doesn't mean you dispose of them in one day, like you go to the estate agent, but you brand this bundle on the market. This is a long, serious program of work that started with a decision taken on one day. And then we looked uh, for the budget report and um, the update monitoring report coming to 6th of December, executive. And I'll say again that. The savings coming forward have been coming forward too slow. We need to go further and we need to go faster. I can't remember who used those two words yesterday, but they, they are a good summary. Uh, we also are waiting for uh, paper on the earmarked reserves because, of course, they're all amalgamated from five councils now. They have to be properly reviewed because many of them are for specific projects and programs of work and they are green banks. So things like Town Deal, Leveling Up, Future High Street Fund, it's absolutely essential that we have an accurate list so that we know which of those reserves might be repurposed 
for budget resilience if necessary. You cannot use other people's reserves or earmarked reserves that are in fence for that purpose. Um, we also look to just the asset management group is bringing forward details of asset disposal. So these are not the commercial investments. They are the five previous councils assets and the pipeline for disposal, um, which I think, Chair, you've already considered commercial investments and asset disposal at this committee. And we also heard um, the need for a high level report on the vision for a sustainable Somerset Council at that executive meeting, which will include what is often called right sizing of the council. And that is the most difficult and most painful bit because that is the bit that includes voluntary redundancies. And the need to ensure that the council and still deliver its statutory and essential programs of work. So there is a really delicate balance. My summing up of all of that list of recommendations is that the only alternative is a section one of the board notice. So we either do all of that work or we accept that we will not be able to better budget, a robust budget with adequacy of reserves next February. And if we can't do that, the 151 officer cannot complete his section 25 report, and therefore it is not a legal budget. So we have a choice of the difficult or the, or the in my mind, impossible to consider. Uh, and that's where we are. Sure, Chair, whether Jason would like to add any more to that. Okay. Yes, so, government finance is quite complex. It's split between revenue and capital, general fund, accounting revenue accounts, treasury investments, non treasury investments, VAT, partial exemption on VAT, depreciation, minimum revenue, revenue provision, prudential indicators, general reserves, the market reserves, reserves held on behalf of others, unusable reserves. Dedicated schools program, I need to block just to name a few of the issues. But actually, the problem we face is quite a simple one. Our costs are increasing at a higher rate than our income. When you look at the table one, on page 195, our net budget requirement is £493 million for the current year. Council tax cuts at £69 cent per month is funded. If council tax is only increasing by 2.99% and all your other costs are coming up by higher than that, you have a problem. That is the crux of the issue that we and other councils across the country face. As I in the report, we do therefore face a very stark and challenging financial position. The financial strategy was approved by the executive in July. We have reviewed that and updated the position, and that is what this paper is before you today. Also, on page 196 and paragraph 40, I've set out some of those uh, actions that we've taken to address the situation. The Chancellor will make his autumn statement on the 22nd of November. Following that, the financial settlement for local government will arrive sometime just before Christmas. That will give us details on the government grant. The council to referendum limits, etc. Not long before we have to set the budget for council in February. We will bring an update paper to the executive in December and therefore we'll come to this body before it goes on to them. And I'm confident the hundred million pounds number that quotes in this paper will reduce. However, I'm not going to even people reduce by that. We've seen the likes of Slang, Croydon, Thurrock, and Birmingham all issue Section 114 notices. But they were for very specific reasons, and I think we're seeing a difference now. For those of you who may have noticed in the press, London Borough of Hayward, for example, they are warning that they're going to issue a Section 114 notice, not because they've done anything stupid, not because they've done anything strange or any, anything like that, just because they're running out of money. And that's where we are. 
I have written to Dina and I'm in our position and had an initial meeting with them on the 6th of October. The chief executive and myself are having a follow up meeting on the 13th of November. They do offer an exceptional financial support package that a number of councils have already accessed, including the two new unitaries in Cumbria. That is in the form of a capitalisation direction. Let's be really clear Section 1 of the call notice is the thing you really want to avoid. It also does not solve the problem. It just puts in an immediate expenditure freeze for 21 days or until you have come together as a full council and set out the credible plan on how you're going to deal with it. It also then triggers government intervention in terms of commissioners. So the answer is let's get the credible plan and address this now rather than pay the commissioners. Just as a guide, the commissioners are on £1,200 plus expenses per day. If you look at that every year, that's likely to cost your council taxpayers somewhere between half a million and a million pounds. That makes your financial situation worse, not better. It's a really stark message and let's do everything we can to avoid that section of mobile Thank you very much. Um, I was going to ask you, Jason, whether you've had a response to your letter sent, but clearly you're in discussions with Pira and Holland uh, responses to letters. Um, I was wondering whether Councillor Ruddle has had a response from the um, Minister for State for Social Care, uh, White on Law, Helen Watley MP. No, I, I haven't. I've actually written two letters to her, but I haven't had a response from either. Thank you. Any comments, questions in the room? Did I just bring that? That's so I'll guess to see. Just one. Is that figure for the cost of commissions in the public domain? Uh, absolutely. There was a big recruitment drive a couple of months ago, um, recognising why, why would he look at recruiting? Um, because they can see what's coming, so they have taken on a number of extra commissions to get ready. Um, so that public figure of £1,200, it's named in the order from the Secretary of State, the appoints commissioners, it sets out that. Um, so yeah, absolutely public domain. So, can I just clarify the government solution to hardship, financial hardship in a local authority is to add four or five million pounds to that hardship before it starts doing things like adding um, uh, uh, adding ten uh, percent council tax, and then they walk away. Right. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so. In, in terms of where we've seen commissioners appointed, uh, usually they're not appointed for a period of time. And usually, if you look at the reports and the councils that, where they have been appointed, as well as financial issues, there's been quite a lot of governance issues. And that's part of why they've been appointed. Birmingham was a slight exception in terms of they have been in the time scale. So commissioners in Birmingham have been appointed for five years. I think. Us and the likes of Hayden that I've mentioned and others are in a different place in terms of the real issue for the commissioners coming in will be have you considered disposing your assets? Yes. Have you considered doing this? Our answer to most of those questions is going to be yes. So the commissioners will not add any value to what you've done if you've been thinking that bit. Yes, um, how many commissioners will we probably need in the space now? Will it be two, three, four? That's, that's a really difficult one to answer. So it has varied depending on the council and what's the drivers behind it. Generally, we see about three. In Birmingham, they've also appointed some political advisors as well. So it depends on what's the real reason for a council issue in the section one on board. Um, Team have been really clear though in their guidance is they do not want councillors issuing section one of the boards. That's where the exceptional support program comes in. 
that's where you can effectively borrow everyday funds. So you can take out under a loan or use capital receipts to fund the revenue expenditure. It doesn't solve the problem, it just pushes it down the road a little bit. So the analogy I use is if you tonight we go to the supermarket, we get to the till and you go, quite I haven't got quite enough money in my current account. You say, please give me my to my mortgage. It's not the best financial thing to do. Also, if you have a capitalization transaction, if you haven't got the capital receipts to fund it, you have to borrow. Because you are in financial trouble, they also penalise you by charging one percent extra on DW on the rates. So there is a real disincentive to do that, which is where I suppose the banks is quite a key thing in terms of avoiding the borrowing. The servicing borrowing cost now is quite expensive. You should just answer my question without me asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, that's a long answer. Thank you. Um, doesn't need a long answer, hopefully a short one. We've heard uh, what Jason's just said about the 114, about doing it ourselves and that. Can we have a date, please, of when something is going to come back of what is suggested that we do? Yeah, so we will be bringing the report in terms of to this body, but also the executive um, in December, we will also be reporting to the executive in January and in February. So there is continued reports all the way through now to budget setting. The picture will be moving quite quickly. Like I said, I'm confident that 100 million pounds will come down. The question is how quickly can we get it down with a credible plan to come to the board of your council? But I can sign off this credit as well. Um, but, and there's a big difference here between a plan that I can sign off, which is one by one has been financially credible, and the plan for those members would want to sign off. There's um, acceptable. acceptable with your political priority. Exactly. Yeah. Just, uh, just very, very briefly, uh, Chairman, um, when that uh, plan comes back, that is come, being brought back for agreement on action, not for debate. Absolutely. Part, Thank you. That's good enough. Yeah. So for part of the things I've put in place, the emergency arrangements, are because we're not seeing that action quickly enough. And that is what we should do. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Kassam. You, Kassam, did you indicate as well? Yeah, I yeah, think, okay, Chairman. I was, I was just going to take a text and um, tables on page 198. Actually, I was quite surprised in what I've seen here. And I'm thinking about going moving forward, how we're actually going, because our tax, the council tax base is very, very low. And I've been looking at tables here, what the former um, districts um, actually contribute to the whole, so they were brought together now, but I'm just looking at what the, the former districts um, contributed or what their what their base was. Um, you can quite clearly see that there are some areas that contribute more than others or did or have a larger amount of properties in those particular bands. Um, or are probably one of the so some said it might be top of the league there. But moving forward, obviously we had um, a case of tax freeze for nearly six years. So moving forward, what I mean, I know we're going to be capital government on that particular thing, but we're always going with that kind of case of tax base. We are going to struggle always, aren't we? We still it needs to be addressed here. And I know we, we talked about it a little bit earlier on with the release schemes, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, but this this is a, a real problem for us with our social care position and our council tax base position, you know, compared to other counties and other unitaries. You know, what work's being done around this to try and address this issue? Congratulations. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's not an easy answer to that because it is a structural deficit. Um, my personal view is that as long as income and expenditure on social care is run on a 
council, my council, both of us will continue to have this difficult situation. I think what's really interesting for me looking ahead and talking to colleagues is whether we're looking at 24, 25 being the equivalent of what they call a bulge year in school numbers, where you have a particular issue for one year, but you know that the year coming on after that settles down, so they have to cope with another class for one year, knowing that that, that, that then moves through all the schools and is predictable. Once it comes in at reception here, predictable, isn't it? What's unpredictable, I think, for us is knowing what happens with social care and particularly with placement costs. Because if we look around at Dorset, Devon, Cornwall, Wiltshire, we see that they are already ahead of us. So even though we play catch up, they're still moving further ahead. And they are more protected because their cancer tax is already higher, both their face in some cases and their yield. So it is, it's a structural deficit. And I know, I mean, there, I don't know how many people there will be in this council running a budget as I ran a budget in the public sector. My budget wasn't huge, but I knew every penny of it. And of course, the capital was separate from revenue. We were trading, so we earned something like 90 something percent of our income. So I was redoing my budget every day as we got towards the end of the financial year and people will be working that way. But my experience is when your income is held or reduces at the same time that your expenditure goes up, that's when you're really in trouble. If you get a problem on one side of your budget, you can pay for that. In the good old days when I used to be able to work contingency into both sides of my budget, I could cope with something happening on a one year basis and then expect it to even out. But this is, we don't know yet whether this is the beginning of a bold year or the beginning of a picture that the new government, whenever a new government is formed, absolutely needs to address because otherwise, there are lots of other councils that in exactly the same situation as us. Yes, if, if you look at the um, page 199, go down to the sort of table there with the comparison of the authorities, you'll see in the analysis below that paragraph 46, we are a low council tax charging authority because of the historical positions, 49 at 63. If we charge the average, our annual so our annual extra income would have been 16.7 million pounds in 47 then you'll see our comparison with some of the other southwest unitaries if we challenge the same as dorset we have 53.4 million pounds in our base and then in four, paragraph 48 actually the problem is it's exacerbated for us as a council because the adult social care preset is based on council tax. It's just the percentage of council tax, so it's a property tax. It doesn't relate to the number of people you have to look after. And if you look at our population trends over 65, particularly the over 85s, we have a higher number than others. So that table I've done, done on page five, just looking at the total number of properties, the tax base, then the total population, and just seeing what the uh, social care precept charge is, You'll see ours is the limit out of all those authorities because we have a lower council tax. You then look at how much we get per head of population. You see that actually, of the adult social care preset, we get £70.50. Pence. But over in the fourth from Dorset, they get £96.24 for every single person. That's a huge difference. So the council tax structural deficit problem is also with hitting out of social care shop. Right. Thank you, Councillor Seaman. 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 Councillor Seaman.
uh, counterfeit here in Somerset, and that would be a very substantial increase in every household's uh, cost, um, which of course would cause a lot of money to go around into health buckets uh, and increase our costs and, and lose all the benefit. But the point is, it's only 53.4 million, and you've just told us uh, that just the mishandling of the uh, of the uh, adult social care reform has hit us by 70. And so we can't fix it through council tax. That, and, and so at best, all we are doing is we're, we're controlling the aircraft now that all three engines are afire, um, and, and we're trying to get as far as we can before it hits the ground. It's still going to crash. That's my problem with the, um, uh, uh, with, with, with the way this thing is set up against us. And it gets worse because when you start doing things like throwing waiting items out of the aircraft, which is effectively the uh, uh, the going off to a fire cell of assets um, in in, uh, in the worst possible circumstances, and noting that sometimes you won't be able to sell them, you have to borrow against that potential future sale at a premium rate, as was pointed out. You know, the government is having it, having you every single way. It's almost like they're on the ground with an anti-aircraft gun trying to bring you down earlier than your uh, uh, than your best light slow. It really is hugely stacked, this game. I can't see a good outcome. So I'm actually wondering whether the smart move isn't to say, well, we're going to crash. What's the best way of handling this over? Handing this over to commissioners. Because I, uh, And what do we need to get into the public domain to the minister? Can't real. He's got to deal with it on day one. Because fundamentally, there is no... I'm, I'm really worried there isn't an outcome for uh, for for um, uh, for some set this uh, this tolerable as a good explanation. Um, I just wanted to make the point that if we were on our own, we might have more sympathy with your thinking about <laughs> an earlier one on board. Often think back to 2017-18 and wonder because the reserves were incredibly low then for the county council whether actually. There should have been a better reset at that point than there was instead of actually getting through it by using MRP and other things that not actually played out very well for us now because we've had to put them right now. Um, I think if we weren't in the same situation as a lot of other councils, as was the case in 1718, you might think differently. My view is that this should be top of everyone's questioning as we go to a general election but i'm damn sure it won't be unfortunately it should be um, it's a really difficult one and i do understand why it's difficult and when you're talking about adult social care you've got a situation where self-funders have for years supported those whose care was paid by a council paid package in children's services, you don't have that. Of course, you could argue that private schools could do that, that they could actually work in some way to mitigate the costs in children's social care, children's services. They might not want to hear that, but you know, it's an argument. But when you're talking to people on the doorstep, as we all do, what comes over? from a lot of people to me is, well, I'm not getting that benefit. Other people are getting that benefit, but not everyone. And that was, I believe, when Boris Johnson stood on the steps of number 10 and said he was launching the Fair Cost of Care and sorted out once and for all. I don't think he had any idea at all of how it works. I don't think he had a clue. And then I think as it unraveled, and he started to understand the financial implications about people retaining their assets, which completely understand why everyone wants to do that. My mother did the same. Um, but when he found out what it would cost in order to provide that fair cost of care and to make sure that providers were paid the same wherever the funding came from, private means or council means, I think it's probably no surprise that they're back again, as they said, I'm told it's postponed, it's not, it's been abandoned. And and now I'm hearing 
that Labour are not putting anything in their manifesto about social care for the next election. And that will be because they'll be sitting in some back rooms somewhere going, oh my goodness, this is huge. I think it's one of the biggest challenges for this country. And we've got plenty already. It's, it, but it needs to be out there. And I fear that it won't be. And we all need to make as much noise as we can to ensure that whatever government thinks, you know, whoever thinks they're going to form the government understands this before they stand on the steps of number 10. Thank you. Councillor Wilkins. I'll move pretty much on the same lines as you're saying, um, to a nation. Um, I was quite a little bit from Councillor Rebel, and it's a little third letter, or letter. Yeah, that's what it's going to be getting with this. I like to believe that I've written, already written two and I had no response. I don't think a third one would do it, but it, 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 I can chase it up, I think. It's the best way I think. Maybe I can ask Sarah as well whether she can chase it up. Thank you. A couple of questions right for In terms of the report we got on page 188, you talk about the and um, each service director having the service challenge sessions and they should be finished by the end of October. Are those all finished and what's your general, I am not in more detail, but your general feeling of how those have been reacted to in terms of one or two in terms of delivering where we go forward? Yes, yeah, so there were 22 different challenge sessions that have happened. Um, there was uh, one of them where there was a few sessions because uh, they didn't get through all the new months in time. They have identified several million pounds worth of savings options, which we'll come before you. They are also working through a number of areas to identify that haven't been cost values to them. That is the key piece of work between now and February to so open those up. They're presenting you to mem as members, particularly on scrutiny because it's the first of February. And here is all the list of all the options across the piece. Um, so yeah, progress has been made and we'll continue to push hard to get, get those delivered um, so that we can actually put a credit and plan for you. A question that the cancellation I've done earlier was the, that I think Councillor C mentioned as well, disposal of, of commercial assets. Um, obviously those that you mentioned that have a bigger built into the budget currently as to what they're generating in terms of revenue. So how is that? feed into to the discussion, but also how do we avoid um, a section in the market that we're having to deal with this now? And I think cancellation addressed that slightly earlier by saying this is starting of a long term thing, which will not necessarily be immediate. We just need to be careful that we don't encourage the market to think that we're um, we're in need of things. We sort it out very rapidly and therefore that's reflected in Yeah, so, so the executive yesterday agreed a couple of things actually. They agreed the principal decision to dispose of the budget. They didn't agree the when and how, as it were. They also agreed to set up a subcommittee of the executive to see that process. They also agreed an asset disposal policy as well, all at the same time. So it's part of the whole the package of things as we were going through the assets. From a financial point of view, actually, we're not doing it by ourselves. We're really doing it, not doing it by ourselves. What we are saying is a decision in principle. There are some of those assets that perform really well, some that perform less well. We are working now through the financial analysis to actually understand how that all fits together. We do have 20 million pounds of income built into our budget. If you sold all the assets, you're selling up 20 million pounds of revenue whole. You might have a big capital receipt, but how, how do you replace them that together? So there's still quite a lot of work to do. So we definitely are there in terms of solving that. So yesterday was the first step on that journey, I would say, rather than getting to the end of the journey. Thank you very much. The final question I was going to ask was, uh, I don't know who can answer it. We, in, in terms of going forward, we, we've said that there's a lot of complex and difficult decisions that we've had. We are now having regular member briefings. Do we have any view as to how that is being by members? Because when we all come to make these decisions in as this year comes to an end, council year, um, we need to make sure that all members understand where we are and are we getting any sort of feeling as to, uh, to how that's being taken up? Because I mean, lots of water and 
But I think it's important that we make sure that all members understand exactly where we are with, with this. And, and I, I looked online yesterday at the executive and again uh, here today, and there's an awful lot of members who aren't hearing the discussions that are going on and just need to make sure that obviously they, they do appreciate where we are and, and you know, the time scale that we're having to work to. Well, Chair, I know that I bore myself with it. <laughs> the same messages again and again because, of course, those of us in political groups know that we do group briefings as well. Things I do with my colleagues um, in the Lib Dem group. I do Q and A sessions as well because everybody needs an opportunity. It should be the case in a public meeting, but often people don't like to ask a question in public. There should be no such thing as a question because. Uh, as Jason has already said, that it's complex stuff, local authority accounting, and when you're pulling in now all the commercial investments and everything else, so, you know, there are there are three sets of potential asset disposals. There's the commercial investments, and there's the asset disposals where we have policy yesterday, which was amended after a lot of helpful interventions from parish and town clerks. And then there's the devolution to parishes and towns where a further policy will come forward in the new year. So it's really easy to just talk about asset disposal, but actually it's coming under three different headings. So um, I do worry that the same people always come to the briefings and the same people don't. I guess I could ask DS to have a look at that and see who might have been missing at everyone because. It's going to be vitally important on the run up to February that people are as informed as possible. Uh, I'd just add to that. So, our first voting actions in this room um, back in August actually we called my and Mark Pickering. Um, we've set up two briefings per month, uh, virtual and face to face. I think generally on the numbers I've seen so far, it's about half the members roughly. I don't know if it's the same amount each time. Um, attending now. Um, I've also attended political group meeting uh, group group, and I will continue to do that on the office there. Um, we have taken an awful lot of financial stuff through all the various speaking committees this year, and we'll continue to do so. Um, my aim always is that by February, people are in a position where they can vote on the budget. I mean, that really clear vote on the budget, not for the budget or against the budget. I, my duty is to make sure members have enough information to be able to do that. Hey, vote is a choice, um, but I need to make sure that everyone's there. Um, but it's obviously a concern if there are people that aren't hearing what to do. I don't know how we can do even more. I think so the suggestions for you have to take it. We are shouting quite loudly. Yeah, yeah, the information can be obtained from the Democratic services, then I think there's going to be a, a role for groups in there because we're saying we're bringing it online and whatever else. I mean, obviously, you've heard there are there are a number of decisions that are coming down the track. We will have more information on our next meeting, and then again, February 1, there will be more detailed information. I think it's it, that was being explained with the the inspector will be the, the help that coming from government. They're not going to have a magic wand. Um, they're not going to suddenly come up with a cunning plan that we haven't seen. So, if to the benefit of the board of all residents of Somerset, we want to try and avoid the wand or if we possibly can, otherwise, that just takes all the control away from our local elected representatives. Uh, we know we've got difficult decisions to make, and, and to say if, if we don't do it, someone else will come and do it to us. Um, Caslan. This is probably, probably the most stupid question of the moment. Um, Jason, if if you um, have got budget necessary and you're happy with it, you're not going to get your own more for Would everybody that's in the council be the first one to close the budget? That's a fair question. That's a controversial one, Mr. Warren, you want to take it? I tell you, it's a stupid <laughs> so on the, on the budget, I have um, a couple of legal duties. And um, one is that I have to sign it up as being robust, and that's part of the section 25 statement. And I suspect that'd be quite a long statement 
this year, um, so that to provide assurance to the council, as it were. I also have to provide you with assurance over the level of reserves. Again, I suspect that's going to be quite a lengthy part of that. Um, so what goes before the members should be a credible budget. It is then down to the members to decide. But members do have a legal duty to set the budget for the year. Um, if you can't agree it on the first meeting, I'm afraid there was a reserve day and come back and have another go. Um, but you know, so the big option would be yeah, through the budget. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, when you're elected, one of the duties is to set the budget. Thank you, and I'll have to see that thing and then why not. It was just a follow-up on that. If we are forced into setting a budget which is in effect in reality a deficit budget because we are using capitalization and uh, other um, uh, tools to, um, uh, to to support the uh, revenue expenditure if we are benefiting from capitalization directly but that you can see the end of the benefits of the capitalization directly because we only have a certain amount of capital we could benefit from the capitalization directly and thus are not sustainable is it possible that we would actually be um, unable to set a sustainable budget at all? And what happens then? Rachel? So set a budget one year at a time, don't they? So we don't sit there and set a budget for three or five years. I think the, the danger for local authorities right across the country and for government thinking is that we all end up only able to work on one year at a time, and it's impossible for any council to think that they can just keep going in capitalisation directions. That's my point. Yeah, so, so local authority cannot set a deficit budget, although the NHS can, and schools can, um, but, but there are lots of issues for our maintained schools as well. So we, we, we kind of, the knock-on effect is quite significant. It's not, it's about the council, yes, but it's about a lot more than, than the kind of central body of the, of the council. In terms of your role, you can only sign off on the budget if it is a work of a sustainable budget. Yeah, it comes, it comes back to that robust budget. Is it robust? Is it credible? Is it believable? Part of my session to I statement, I do have to look into the medium term that mine things. And if you read my statement this year, I did highlight that the benefit of schools grant was a real issue um, in, in terms of when that word comes back backs on to our books, as it were. Um, so although legally we set budget on an annual basis, I do have to as part of that outline the future issues. But I think if you were to look at most section 25 statements from most of the council's chief finance officers, I think they're going to be quite dire warnings about the longer term and a lot of few councils coming forward. Yeah, but still I'm looking for, um, uh, uh, for an answer because I believe the situation we are in at present, and indeed we knew we were going into it this year because we use reserves this year. Uh, so we knew we had a challenge and savings had to be delivered in order to balance books in the long time. We covered the gap with, uh, with reserves. We are we have been tipped into an abyss by external factors, um, uh, uh, particularly the war in Ukraine and the uh, the stress of inflation that came from both of those, and the uh, uh, and the reshaping of the market to like social care. And I'm keep hanging on that front. Both of which are of such a magnitude that they work out the possibility of covering um, the next year entirely from reserves, and we had to take much further structural uh, thing. But as we've heard in this meeting, large parts of our expenditure are mandatory. There are services we do not get discretion over. We might get some discretion over level, but eventually you reach the point where a court will not believe you're delivering the service. So there is actually a flaw there. And whilst we're not reaching that point this next year at the moment, I believe that within the life of the council it's possible we could get to the point where we cannot do anything except 
going to the year knowing that we are going to run out of capitalization directed heavily um, and money is available to us. And what happens if we can't set a budget at the end of that year? Because there is simply not a way to balance the available income allowed by Parliament and the expenditure required by Parliament. What happens at that point? Rather than deal with the technical point that you, you say, and there is a possibility, I think before then, though, we get to the final recommendation from the MTFS update paper, which is to hear from, be from the chief executive, because the vision comes from the top of an organisation. Local authorities and governments are different because you kind of have two at the top, in effect, don't you have a leader and a chief executive? That vision for a smaller, leaner council with fewer offices, there will be fewer offices and fewer officers, and more streamlined, hopefully more efficient, that that must come before the inevitable, which is saying to government it's not possible to set budgets for local authorities any longer. You could not possibly go to that position with the government without having first gone through a vision for resizing your council. And of course, we've got some advantage at this point of the councils having come together, not least because we've got the learning from lots of different councils. And uh, I, I recall I went in as a member council in 2019 when they were well in, uh, Councillor Hamble will remember this, well into hot desking and people working three days a week, not five. So doing two days working at home, three days in the office, and a, and a quite a different way of working, which now of course looks well ahead of its time and ahead of COVID too. Very nice to see that part of the council. Uh, I believe it's 263 million ish we spend on people. And if we got that down to 10 million, see, yes, like, which is just completely ludicrous, couldn't possibly do it. There's still the fundamental problem <coughs> that your own social care is at uh, uh, cost 90, I think 93% is the figure given, is an external purchase. So that's not us, we, and we don't get a choice of whether we, uh, we provide that. And presuming procurement is being worked and profited, that should be cheaper than most doing it ourselves. So we've still got to do that. And, and I'm, I'm still get, trying to get after this because actually I think this goes to part of the arguments with the Minister. Uh, you can't deny the structural deficit, and you are going to have to fix it because there is this unknown thing that happens at the end where you end up in a situation where it is actually impossible under any circumstances to use any of the available tools to, uh, to set a budget and this will happen and, and that's the bit which um, which is the general election question so we briefly want to yeah i think you're making it similar one to what i'm saying when you look at the council that have gone through it one one four what's the bit that said about because they've done something about describing stuff. Mm -hmm. What you are seeing now is councils that actually mm -hmm. the one awful process wasn't designed for this. If you look at its history back to 89, this was designed when councils were about to make a silly decision. The chief finance officer had to step in and say, hang on, pause, just think what this means, etc. That, that's what it was kind of designed for. It wasn't designed in a place where actually you just got the money. So the actual process isn't fit for purposes at the moment. But we remain hopeful that the awesome statement will bring us joy for those of the It's a bit of hope, not so well in there, really, I promise. Um, but the point is, the government will send us back to you. Sorry, you're a local authority, you're locally elected, get on with it. Yeah, there isn't a lot of sympathy for local authorities out there, and it's hard as it's all unfair and it's structural and all the rest of it. They will turn it back to you and say, you are the elected members, get on with it. Unfortunately, let's hope the system changes. I, I think if you're in a national picture, there has got to be some give in the next year or two, because otherwise we we'll just have commissioners running virtually half the councils in the country over the next few years. Yeah. Oh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the things that we've made for that reform, I think, um, one of the things that really worries me is that the none of your figures, Jason, take into account the problem with the NHS and the 25% of and the 25% of beds that are blocked in Yeovil, which should be on our budget uh, for social care, and 30% in Musgrove, the same detail. Um, and if we manage to get more money, what would happen if the NHS then did, uh, escorted all those people out and said, they're your responsibility, they've got their medical problems, what are you intending to do about it? If I, if I could come in at this point um, and just talk a little bit about the work that Newton Europe is doing. Councillor Ruddle's got a wall, that's what I mean. The work of Newton Europe is, is about reablement and ensuring that when people go into hospital that we have much better processes for them being able to come back home where many, many, most people want to be. And so that work is not about the cohort at the moment and reducing the cohort who are in placement. It's more about how in the future we work. And that all feeds back into that conversation about whether this is the equivalent of a gold year. And with the Homes and Horizons work, with the work with Newton Europe, you know, both of which cost good money. Um, the Homes and Horizons, of course, that's mainly capital because it's actual houses for these young people and staff to live in. And that worries me far, far less than revenue expenditure because, of course, you've still got the house. You're not building something or a commercial investment where the market may be different in the future. You're buying good houses. You're improving their um, rating. You know, uh, energy rating, and you've still got those houses. So although they're, they're sitting there from, from, and, and they're part of the borrowing, as far as I'm concerned, that's a really good investment. So I think I'm still looking at whether this next year is the equivalent of a bold year or whether we are part of a national trend that is going to end up more in Councillor Steve's prediction than in the prediction I might be hoping for. And I think we still have a lot more work to do, and I think we still need to be a great deal more creative in how we work in, those, in both adults and children's, because um, I, know, I know somebody who's moved to Somerset recently, so I'll try not to say anything that might give away who it is, and it's somebody who was um, complaining to me about there being no council money for a certain particular type of service in the Mendip area. Um, the, the, the child of that family is still in a different county and their placement is over half a million pounds a year. My own cousin has motor neuron disease. She now has a continuing health care plan, health plan from the NHS. Her care is running at in excess of 300,000 a year, and that's what it's costing to care for her 24 seven. She's, she's surviving that awful disease for much longer and much better than people expected. But there is a cost, she wouldn't mind me saying that. She was a social worker herself. She understands care costs. If we want to look after people and we want people to have the longest and the best lives they can have, preferably we need them to be living those lives in their own homes, it's going to continue to be a challenge. And, you know, in this country, we have, and they, you know, we're really fortunate. We, we have the Human Rights Act, we have Age Discrimination Act, we have lots of things that give people protection in their lives. Um, Perhaps we have too low a rate of taxation, perhaps nationally we don't take taxation more where we should. Full taxes, 
Maybe we tax companies as wholesalers when they're actually retailers. Perhaps those people put bans on the road that don't contribute in the way that you might hope they did for a high-waste budget. You know, it's all high-level government stuff that we can't impact ourselves, but we get the effect of it down the line in local government. I, I said yesterday, and I really mean it, I think ministers and secretaries of state and all MPs should come and do work experience at a local authority. And, I, and they need to be reminded when they come to do their work experience that it's 24 hours a day in the care sector and it's seven days a week. So, you know, remember that when you sign up to come to Sunset for a couple of weeks' work experience. I'd love to be able to organise that. Thank you very much. Um, as again, just to, to conclude, thank you all for your contributions today. I mean, as we've seen, an awful lot of work has gone into to where we are currently, and there's an awful lot of work to go. As has been mentioned, there are growing pressures across the council in terms of the needs as well as the, the, the financial side. Um, we all appreciate the fact there are decisions going ahead. We need to engage members very much in, in that. And thank you for the work we've done on that so far. Um, Next time round, obviously, as I say, we will be feeding into the, the executive uh, who will be meeting from, but it will be important again to get input from, from members. Thank you for those members who've been here uh, today and have joined us online and the contribution which you've made. Um, I think I'd like cancellation on that and uh, Mr. Bourne uh, for your answer and addressing the, the, the questions that we've had today, uh, and we will take those things forward. Um, I'll also thank Mr. Nicholson as well, his. Uh, you're leaving us today for being the, the committee manager um, to other other committees elsewhere within the council. But thank you very much for your contributions to the meeting so far. Uh, and I will close the meeting at about half past twelve. And thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.